everybody and welcome to our second virtual talk of 2021 brought to you once again with the help of Kian Manning and the expertise of Fiona Percy. This month's contribution comes from David Robson, a native of Tipperary who grew up in Mallow and studied English and history in UCC. Currently working as a tour guide in Kilmainham Jail, David enjoys literature both as a reader and writer. Indeed, he himself writes fiction and poetry. Let's not forget that he's a film buff, and many of you will have fond memories of uh, his talk to the Watford Archaeological and Historical Society on the making of Barry Lyndon. However, this time we will hear about the post-independence generation of Irish writers and their importance to Irish cultural history, focusing on two writers of this generation, Patrick Kavanagh and Flann O'Brien, who have been widely translated. And over to you now, David Robson. Hi everyone, hope you're all keeping well during these very strange times. Thanks very much for clicking into this, this video. I hope you folks enjoy it. So what I want to talk to you today about is the Irish post-independence literary renaissance. Now I'm calling it the post-independence renaissance because I want to distinguish it from the Gaelic revival that happened in the early 20th century. So just to begin, in the 19th century, Irish culture was very much frowned upon. You know, you had this image of the drunken Irishman, the scoundrel, and it was very, very pervasive throughout the British Empire and throughout the world, really, at the time, unfortunately. So then, with the coming of the 20th century, you have the rise of nationalism and the rise of modernism. And this was very much an international cultural movement and it affected the Irish cultural movement as well. You have the likes of W.B. Yeats, Lady Gregory, J.M. Singh, hearkening back to those old Irish myths, the Fianna, Cúchulainn, Oisín, the land of Tyrann and Anog, and you had them returning to the modern Irish mindset. On the other side then, you've got James Joyce. Joyce would have been the definitive modernist for a lot of people because Joyce's work is very stream of consciousness, it's very experimental, but unlike Yeats and Gregory, Joyce wasn't looking for a national voice. Joyce had a much more internationalist outlook and he had a much more individual outlook. But what these writers all had in common was that they were writing in a period when Ireland was still ruled by the British Empire. So Ireland as a nation didn't really exist. They were striving to make it exist. But then the next generation had to deal with the Irish nation that did exist. And a lot of them were very critical because the nation that emerged, of course, was very socially conservative and it had this image of itself that I suppose really was founded by the Gaelic revival. It was an image of a rural utopia. And anyone who kind of went against that would be in danger of censorship. Now, writers like Frank O'Connor, Kate O'Brien, Brendan Behan, Patrick Kavanagh, Flann O'Brien, Sean O'Fuelon, Anthony Cronin, I mean, they were not going to portray Ireland as a utopia. They were going to call things as they saw them. And they were really, tr they're real trailblazers when it came to their writing. Now, I could talk for hours about this great generation of Irish writers, but we don't have hours. So I'm going to focus on two writers in particular. So I'm going to start off with the farmer poet, Patrick Kavanagh. Now, Patrick Kavanagh was born in Inishkeen in 1904 to a small farming family. As the eldest child, Patrick was supposed to inherit the farm, but his father said that he had broken every tool on the farm and he had only bent the crowbar. So the crowbar was the only thing to survive him, apparently. So Kavanagh was not meant to be a farmer. 
he was meant to be a poet because he was always a voracious reader. He even left school at the age of 13 and continued reading. He read the books that his siblings were using in schools. And then he actually started writing his own poetry and it was published in local newspapers and magazines. And it was noticed eventually by George William Russell, who was the editor of the Irish Statesman magazine, and he was mo known more so by his pseudonym A.E. Now, A.E. really encouraged Kavanagh as a poet. He kind of said to him, you know, you have to move out and become a full-time poet. So he went to London, first of all, in 1938, and returned to Ireland in 1939 after the start of the Second World War. Now, Kavanagh was based in Dublin for the second half of his life, really. And he wanted to try and break on to the Dublin literary scene, but he found it very difficult. And he would always go to the Palace Bar, which was the local of the Irish Times. And he started off basically going there as a, almost a networking event. But you have to understand that the literary establishment in Ireland had this particular image of rural Ireland. It was of the rural ideal. You know, it was a rural utopia. And poetry written about rural Ireland was by and large written by upper to middle class Anglo-Irish people who would go on excursions to rural Ireland before returning to the safety of Dublin. So when people first met Kavanagh, they were shocked to find out that he actually was a farmer because an ordinary small Catholic farmer writing poetry, that was something unheard of at the time. And also Kavanagh was portraying a very realistic version of rural Ireland. It wasn't a utopia. It wasn't unkind either. Kavanagh, Kavanagh's poetry, I find certainly can be very affectionate about his background, but he let, but he didn't allow for any illusions about the hardships of rural life or anything along those lines. And because of that, his work was deemed quite controversial, particularly works like The Great Hunger and Terry Flynn. Now, both these works received censorship. For a lot of reasons, as I mentioned before, they're very realistic about the way they portrayed rural life. And they're also very matter of fact when it comes to talk of sexuality. And they're quite irreverent of the sacred cows uh, in, Ireland, in Irish society back in those days. So they did receive censorship and Kavanagh became something of a bohemian poet say he changed from the palace bar to McDade's bar. Now McDade's was the local bar of Envoy magazine and of course Envoy was a literary magazine and it was where a lot of these sort of outsider writers would have written. But the way things normally went was that they would go to work in the morning, close up the offices, offices at Envoy at about one o'clock head over to McDade's for a few pints and do the real work. Now, who else drank in McDade's was this man, Flan O'Brien, or Brian O'Nolan, who was really the great Irish postmodernist. Now, he was born Brian O'Nolan in 1911 in Straban. Now, his father worked for the Revenue Commission and the family eventually settled in Dublin. But they were actually an Irish-speaking family. They spoke Irish in their house, but they changed to English when they had visitors. So, so Flann O'Brien was very much introduced to both worlds of Ireland, the old Ireland and the new emerging Ireland. And he was quite a successful student. He wrote in literary magazines in UCD under the pseudonym of Brother Barnabas. Now, after leaving UCD, he published his first novel, which was The Great At Swim Two Birds. Now, At Swim Two Birds is regarded by many as being the first postmodernist novel. So if you regard James Joyce as being the great modernist writer, 
Flann O'Brien must surely be regarded as the great postmodernist writer, because At Swim Two Birds is a novel about a young man trying to write a novel about a man who is trying to write stories based on Irish mythology, and the characters in his stories try to murder him. So it's very much a novel that is ir irreverent. It has lots of dark humour, it has unreliable narration, and it's packed full of metafiction, which is something that postmodernism post is really all about. Now, this novel was published by Longman and Greens, and it was published under the advisement of Graham Greene. Graham Greene was a reader for them, and he read this book and he loved it. So you can imagine this should have been a baptism of fire for Flann O'Brien, a great start to a glittering career, but everything that could have gone wrong went wrong. Only a few copies of it were sold in its first year, and the warehouse in which it was being printed was bombed by the Luftwaffe in London. So the vast majority of copies were destroyed, unfortunately. Now, a lot of readers were looking at this book and they were scratching their heads. A lot of writers who read the book really loved it, particularly, as I said before, Graham Greene. Dylan Thomas was a huge fan, and it was one of the last novels that James Joyce ever read, and he loved it. Now, Flan Bryan then wrote his second novel, which was The Third Policeman, and he sent that to Longmans again, but Graham Greene was gone. And there was nobody there to to back for avant-garde fiction, so they didn't publish The Third Policeman. And this was a dreadful blow to Flann O'Brien. And so Breen and Ulan did not publish another English language novel as Flann O'Brien until 1961 with A Hard Life. Now, he did still write. He wrote mainly under the pseudonym of Miles McGopoly. And he wrote a great column in the Irish Times called Crushkeen Lawn. And he also had a job as well as a civil servant. He worked in the Department of Local Government. He eventually became a private secretary to Sean McEntee. So unlike Kavanagh, he did have a steady income. Now, it would be wrong of me to say that those men did not receive recognition in their lives, because they did. Patrick Kavanagh found that his poetry was being appreciated in the likes of Britain, in America, and he actually gave uh, lectures in America. Brian O'Nolan found that his work was being studied in American colleges as examples of postmodernism, along with the likes of Vladimir Nabokov and Thomas Finch. So he found that his work was, be was being acclaimed decades after it had been written. Unfortunately, both those men were alcoholics and their alcoholism left psychological and physical scars on them. And Brian O'Nolan died in 1966 at the age of 54 and Patrick Kavanagh died in 1967 at the age of 63. Now, what I'm saying about these two writers is that Although they did receive acclaim towards the end of their lives, they did not receive it during their lives. They did not receive it for the majority of their lives, I should say. And today, while they are famous, they, they're not really half as famous as the likes of W.B. Yeats and James Joyce. And sure, James Joyce has an entire day devoted to his work in Bloomsday, which you know, I feel it, he absolutely, it is absolutely deserved. But why don't we have, say, a Kavanaugh Day or a Flann O'Brien Day? And I would say that a lot of it is because at the time their work wasn't appreciated. And, say, they didn't have Yeats's, Yeats's national question at heart. There's no romantic Ireland in their, in their work. And they didn't have the backing of international people like James Joyce, had the backing of Ezra Pound and Harriet Shaw Weaver. They didn't have that. And 
I suppose if you guys take nothing else from this talk, I'd like you to read more Irish writers because the two lads I've talked about here, they are two of the most famous writers from this generation. There are so many other great writers who have been virtually written out of the canon of Irish literature. So I really would say to you guys, read more Irish literature and even try to read the writers that history has forgotten. So I just want to say thanks a million for uh, watching this video and I hope you guys enjoyed it. So hopefully next time we see y'all it'll be under better circumstances and we can meet 